So we left off. We didn't discuss it much because there's, we don't re you don't really need to. Um, the last scene of Act Four, where the king and Laertes plot essentially their revenge or vengeance or however you want to describe it um, against Hamlet. Notice in a in a revenge play. Usually the protagonist has got to get revenge against uh, the people who have killed the protagonist's family, members of their family, et cetera, et cetera. A little twist Shakespeare throws in is obviously there's more than one person seeking revenge because Hamlet has to get vengeance against Claudius, but then Laertes also deserves some kind of vengeance against Hamlet, okay? Um even though Hamlet's killing of Polonius was, I don't know that I'd call it accidental. <laughs> he did actually intend to kill the person who was behind the heiress. He just didn't know who the person was. Um, so you couldn't say that it's premeditated murder. So Act 5 begins with what's often called either the clown or the gravedigger scene. Okay. Why? Shakespeare has created so much tension that we've got to have some kind of comedic relief before the rest of the play goes on. Um, because on the basis of at least of what Aristotle says in his book on poetics, you know, the purpose of tragedy is to build up tension, to build up suspense, to build up the twin... Um, passions of pity and fear, and then to have the catharsis to release them, okay? So we get two clowns, with spades and Maddox. And the first clown says, Is she to be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation? Okay? Christian burial. Why is he asking about that? Notice what the clown suggests, or the gravedigger, suggests has happened. He says Ophelia did what? Killed herself. She killed herself. But this was suicide. This wasn't an accident. All right? Is it clear that Ophelia committed suicide? No, the play leaves, it, leaves that open to interpretation. What are we told? She was out on a branch trying to gather some flowers that I guess were growing over the bank of the stream, and she fell and drowned. Second clown, I tell thee she is. Therefore, make her grave straight. That is, make it immediately. But it also means do it right. Do it appropriately. The crowner, that is coroner, hath sat on her and found, finds, finds it Christian burial. Okay, the coroner. Why? In England, okay, uh, whenever there's a death, there's a coroner's inquest. The coroner has to determine the cause of death. Okay? So they've got to determine, was it an accident or was it intentional? Now we're told, the coroner says... It was an accident. She did not intend suicide. First clown, how can that be unless she drowned herself in her own defense? Now, he's introducing an idea Hamlet is going to introduce, reintroduce later. He's saying she, in defense of herself, the clown is suggesting, she, in defense of herself, killed herself. Why? Because herself isn't the thing acting. He's introducing pre-introducing, let me put it this way, kind of the notion of the defense by madness, the insanity defense. Right? Tis found so. It must be, say, offendendo, you've got a gloss down there, bottom of comic mistake for, say, defendendo, a term used in verdicts of self-defense. But notice, we're told it's comedic and it's, it's essentially a malapropism, but I don't think it is. That is, yes, it's intended that the clown doesn't know what he's saying. He's like the character of Dogberry, Much Do About Nothing. 
who repeatedly says the wrong thing. But the clown in saying this thing is getting across the idea that Shakespeare wants to get across. Say, what was it? Of Findendo, it's offense against the self. It cannot be else, for here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, wittingly means knowingly, it argues an act. And an act hath three branches. It's to act, to do, to perform. Therefore, she drowned herself wittingly. That is, the clown says, the coroner's wrong. Okay? Could be. After, <laughs> shouldn't even go there. After all, one coroner said Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. Another coroner said, pretty much consistent with strangulation. When you get two big bruises on either side of the, the pharynx, indicating thumb pushing, um, that doesn't happen by a knot with a bed sheet. So, keep going. That is second clown. Here you, Delver, give me leave. Here lies the water. Okay. That is, let, let's walk our way through this. Here's the water. Here's the man. If the man go to the water and drown himself, it is willy-nilly. He drowned him. But if the water come to him and drown him, well, then he drowns not himself. Argal, that is ergo, he that is not guilty of his own death shortens not his own life. But is this law? Aye, Mary, is it? It's crown and quest law. Okay? And so the second clown says, you want to hear the real truth of the matter? You want to hear why this is really happening? It's, it's kind of the elites and everybody else. He says, if this had not been a gentlewoman, she should have been buried out of Christian burial. If she wasn't a high-standing member of society, daughter of the previous advisor to the king, she'd have been buried in unhallowed ground. See, the importance about Christian burial, you're buried in the Christian churchyard. The idea is, those that are buried there, they'll go to heaven. Those buried outside, okay, suicide, according to the church, largely the Catholic church, but also even, you know, a lot of Protestants in Shakespeare's day, suicide was the quote-unquote unforgivable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit. Why? You can't repent from it. It's saying my problems are so big, the Holy Spirit can't help me. And you can't repent before you do it. I mean, that's kind of classical logic. You, you can't be sorry for something you haven't yet done. You can only be sorry for it after you've done it, okay? So, he says, first clown, they're spot on. You're right. And the more pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to go to drown or hang themselves more than they're even Christian. Come, my spade, there is no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditches, and grave diggers. That is, the oldest workers in the world. Why? Because we do what Adam did. Old Adam, back in the Garden of Eden. Right? Was he a gentleman? No, I was the first that ever bore arms. Little gloss down there. Bore arms. To be entitled to bear a coat of arms would make Adam a gentleman. But as one who bore a spade, our common ancestor was an ordinary delver in the earth. When my spade was he a gentleman? Uh, he had none. That is, he had no arms. What? Are a heathen? How dost thou understand the scripture? The scripture says Adam did. How could he not dig? How could he dig if he didn't have any arms? So the one is punning on the meaning of the word arms, that is, coat of arms. The other one is taking it literally. Okay. They go on, they talk about other kinds of, you know, makers and such, gallows makers and such. Hamlet comes in with Horatio. Line 65. So... We see the, which one? First grave digger is down in the grave. Now he's digging, he's digging. He's dug deep enough that he's in the grave, throwing up dirt and throwing up bones. Common practice, Elizabethan England, to reuse graves. Land was a premium. So Hamlet sees that. And Hamlet asks, has this fellow no feeling of his business? 
A saint's in grave making? Hamlet's attitude is, somebody's just died, you should be sad. Hamlet doesn't know who's died. Notice. Horatio, custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. He's done this so much, he doesn't pay any attention to what's going on. Tazine so. First clown keeps singing, throws up a skull. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. Notice what Hamlet has just done. He's equated the skull with the gravedigger, because the gravedigger is singing while he throws up that skull. How the knave jowls it to the ground, as if it were twain, uh, Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. This might be the paint, the head, face of a politician, which this ass now overreaches. Why does he think politician? Well, what's the king? Chief of all politicians. What was Polonius? He was a politician. One that would circumvent God, might it not? Well, how do politicians try to circumvent God? <laughs> circumvent, go around. Force their will on other people, okay? Outrun fate, so to speak. Horatio, you, you're right, it might. Or it could have been a courtier. So, he starts with politicians, and then he goes to those who suck up on politicians, the courtiers. And in Shakespeare's day, at Queen Elizabeth's court, at her father's court, there were a lot of courtiers. What do we call courtiers today? Well, it's a different system, right? But they would largely be government bureaucrats. Right? People who are living off the largesse of government. Government. So, Horatio, yeah, you're right, could be. Hamlet, why e'en so, and now my lady worms chapless and knocked about the mazard with a sexton paid, sexton's spade. Here's fine revolution. Revolution. Hamlet's implying the circle of life. Because what happened? Whoever this person was, they were born, they died. They died, they were put in the earth, the body rotted, the, dead, the grave is dug up again. They're thrown back out, and then they'll go back in. All right? Here's a fine revolution, and we had the trick to see it. Did these bones cost no more than the breeding but to play at loggets with them? The breeding. Was this person simply born so that these bones could be cast up so we could take notice of them? Gravedigger throws up another skull. Why not that? May that not be the skull of a lawyer? So, politician, courtier, lawyer. Lawyers had some rank in Shakespeare's day. They were often looked at the exact same way. A lot of people look at lawyers today. In one of the Henry VI plays, one of the characters says, first kill all the lawyers. Why? Because then we won't have people quibbling about the little fine details of what to do. Where be his quiddities now? His quiddities. What did Bill Clinton famously say in his deposition when he was, you know, being interviewed by Ken Starr in the whole impeachment scenario? Not the impeachment, the, the Paula Jones sex, whatever. He quibbled on the definition, the meaning of is. He said, well, it all depends on what the meaning of is is. Okay, that's a lawyer's mind. Most people would say, well, is means is. It, you don't have to define it. Okay. Where be his quiddities now, his quillities, his cases, his tenures, his tricks? Why does he suffer this mad knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel and will not tell him of his action of battery? In other words, he's saying, lawyers are what kind of people? Well, it's part of their job, right? They are litigious. You do the smallest thing. Boom, I'm going to slap you with a lawsuit. 
I'm going to take you to court. This fellow might be in his time, the skull, a great buyer of land with his statutes, his recognizances, his fines, his double vouchers. These are all aspects of the legal trade of land. His recoveries, is this the fine of his fines, the recovery of his recoveries, that is the getting back of what he recovered? To have his fine paid full of fine dirt, will his vouchers vouch him no more, etc., etc.? Horatio, nope, not a bit. Dead's dead. Okay. Is parchment not made of sheepskins? Uh, yeah, calfskins too. They are sheep and calves which seek out assurance in that. What? Parchment. He's talking what we would call a piece of paper. They had paper in Shakespeare's day. So he's drawing attention to actual parchment, not paper. Why? Because laws are inscribed on parchment, not just regular, regular ordinary paper. Um, deeds and charters and things like that were often written on parchment. It used to be the case, and it still is the case, at some very elite universities, when you graduate and you get your diploma, that diploma is on parchment. That is, some poor cow gave its all so that you could get Bachelor of Arts on that. Okay? Why is Hamlet drawing a distinction or drawing attention to that? Is not parchment made of sheepskins? And Horatio says, yeah, lambskin, calfskins too. They are sheep and calves which seek out assurance in that. In what? In what is written on the parchment. They are sheep and calves who seek assurance, who seek finality, who seek significance in what? The written law. What's Hamlet saying? You can't trust that. They're sheep and calves. Well, what became the parchment? Sheep and calves. Sheep and calves are slaughtered to make this. Those people who trust in the law, they are sheep to be slaughtered. The law, Hamlet is suggesting, is going to do what to them? It's going to cut them down. And so he asked the grave digger, whose grave is this? Mine? Um, okay, yeah, it's yours because you lie in it. That is, you, you are in it. You're digging it. You lie out on it, sir, and therefore tis not yours. That is, you're not in the grave. You're near it. For my part, I do not lie in it, yet it is mine. That is, Hamlet says you lie in it, meaning he is physically in it. The grave digger is literal. Notice the grave digger is kind of acting like a lawyer. He's taking everything very literally. He says, no, no, I'm in it, but I do not lie in it. It's mine. It's mine as long as what? As long as he's digging it. Once he's done digging it, it's no longer his. Okay? Hamlet, thou dost lie in it. Thou... Now it's ha how is Hamlet using the word, the verb lie? You're telling an untruth. To be in it and say it is thine. Tis for the dead. Graves are for the dead. You don't put living people in graves. Not for the quick. Quick means alive. Therefore thou liest. Tis a quick lie, sir. Twill away again from me to you. What man dost thou dig it for? Hamlet does not mean man gender. He means for what person? First clown replies, well, it's not a man's grave. Okay, Hamlet, fine. Okay, what woman then? None. Hamlet's, okay. Who's to be buried in it? Oh, one that was a woman. Sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute the name is. Absolute means literal, right? Why does he say the thing that is to be put in the grave is not a woman? Because a woman is living, and a man is living. Take the soul away, it's a sack of meat. It's it. It's bones. 
Hamlet, how absolutely, this guy could be a lawyer. We must speak by the card that is very literally with him or equivocation will undo us. Okay? So, he asks the grave digger, how long hast thou been grave, <coughs> grave maker? Of all the days in the year, it came to it that day that our last king, Hamlet, overcame Fortinbras. That is, Fortinbras Senior, not the young Fortinbras that we meet in the play. Hamlet. And how long, when was that? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that was. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. Okay, so we're getting an idea of how old Hamlet is. He that is mad and sent to England. Uh, why was he sent to England? Why? Because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there, or if it do not, tis no great matter there. He'll come into his right mind there, but if he doesn't, it won't matter. Why? It will not be seen in him there. Okay. Where's the place at? Elsinore, Denmark. What is Shakespeare saying about his own place? Everybody's crazy in England. So, so Hamlet asks, how came he mad? Very strangely. How strangely? Well, by losing his wits. That is the definition of madness. Upon what ground? Upon what ground? Because of what matter? On what foundation? Why, here in Denmark, that is. The ground was here in Denmark where he lost his wits. I have been sexton here, man and boy, 30 years. So when did Fortin, when did old King Hamlet defe defeat old King Norway? 30 years ago. How old is Hamlet? 30. Does Hamlet, up to this point, come across like a 30-year-old? He's a university student. What kind of university student? With some exceptions. Is, 30, is Hamlet a graduate student? No. So why is he still a university student? What's he doing, really? Biding his time. I mean, why is Prince Charles still Prince Charles? Because his mother won't die. She's like the ever-ready bunny. She just, you know. So Hamlet's 30. How old's Ophelia? How old's Laertes? We're not told. But it doesn't, Ophelia doesn't sound. She doesn't come across as someone who's 30. She comes across as someone probably in her late teens, early 20s. By, you know, I don't know what to think. You'll tell me what to think, won't you, Father? Won't you, Brother, you know? How long will a man lie on the earth ere he rot? Um, if he's not rotten before he dies. Rotten there kind of implied if he doesn't have the pox, syphilis, or some other STD. Or if he's not, you know, riddled with sin. The last eight years or more? Nine. Tanner will last you nine years. Why will a tanner last you longer? Because of the chemicals. And they're all natural chemicals, like goat urine. Okay, A tanner would work with. That's one of the things they use to tan the hide, to scrape it. But the tanner, because the tanner is around all these natural chemicals, the tanner's skin gets like the leather that he works with. Okay? That's why he says, it's already kind of preserved, so it'll last a little bit longer. Okay, And he goes on and explains why. So he pulls up a skull. This is the third skull notice. This grave's been used a lot. Here's a skull now, has lying you in the earth, three and twenty years. Three and twenty years. Whose was it? Poor son, mad fellow. Who do you, uh, York skull, the king's jester. Hamlet. This? 
Huh? Let me see. He takes the skull. And there's all kinds of famous, there's portraits, you know, there's, not portraits, posters and stuff of Hamlet looking at the skull. One of the most famous passages throughout the play. Let me see. Alas, poor York. Notice, he doesn't say, it's kind of like Casablanca. He never said, you know, Humphrey Bogart's character never says, play it again, Sam. Hamlet never says, alas, poor York, I knew him well. He says, alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, a most excellent fancy, fancy, fantasy, imagination. He hath bore me on his back a thousand times. And now how abhorred in my imagination that is in my fancy it is. But imagination here doesn't mean the ability to conjure up images that nobody has ever seen before. Here, in my memory. He looks at the skull, and he thinks of when he used to ride on York's back. It's kind of like it's disjointing to him. My gorge rises. He wants to vomit. Here hung those lips that I have kissed. I know not how oft. Where are your jibes now? Come on, York. Spout off, mouth off, make some funny joke. Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment. Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chop-fallen, his chaps, his cheeks. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Who's my lady? Is it his mother? Or is it any gentle lady? What's he mean? mean? To this favor you must come. You're going to look like this too. That's why he says, you can put makeup on an inch thick. It's not going to hide the skull. Horatio. Hamlet said, asked Horatio, tell me one more thing. What's that? You think Alexander looked like this? Alexander the Great. That's who he's referring to. Uh, yeah. Whew. Smelled like this. Yeah. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? There's that idea of revolution again. To what base the earth uses we may return? What did he say about Polonius when the king asked, where's Polonius? He's at a politic convocation of worms. A convocation, a calling together. One worm found him and said, hey boys, let's eat. Politic. Okay. Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till I find it stopping a bunghole? Let's let's sit and ponder this for a moment, Horatio. Let's think of Alexander the Great, okay, who conquered the known world at the time. And let's sit and think about how he died and then somebody dug up the ground that he was buried in and from that made a stopper, made a cork, essentially, to plug up a bunghole. What's a bunghole? A hole in a cask. Okay? You put the spigot in and you draw beer or wine from it. For to consider too curiously to consider so. In other words, yeah, that's thinking about things a little bit too much there, Hamlet. Horatio doesn't like this kind of where this idea is going. Because Hamlet's going to take this idea and he's going to take it to its logical conclusion. No, Faith. No, not a jot. It's not too curious. Let's 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 trace this. But to follow him thither with modesty enough in likelihood to lead it. As thus, Alexander died. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust. From dust thou art, to dust shalt thou return. The dust is earth. Of earth we make loam, then it's clay. And why of that loam whereto he was converted? Notice, in As You Like It, we saw... 
Duke Frederick meet a holy man and, as Jaquie put it, became a convertite, converted, changed his evil, bad nature for a good nature. Here, it's actual physical nature that's being converted from human form to clay form. Converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? What's Hamlet getting at? What was his very first soliloquy about? Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, resolve itself into a dew. This tainted flesh. That it would be what? Made perfect. How? By being distilled. Well, this isn't being distilled, is it? This is that flesh being conglomerated with other flesh, clay, and being used to stop a beer barrel. So, think of the beer in the barrel that sloshes up against the clay. It, it all takes on a little tincture of that clay flavor. What did Hamlet say earlier about a king? A king can do what? Go a progress through the guts of a beggar. How? Because the beggar goes out and fishes. The beggar catches, uses a worm. The worm has eaten of the clay of a king's body. The worm is caught by the fish. The beggar catches the fish. He eats the fish. Therefore, he eats the king's body. Alexander died, was buried, returned to dust, the dust of the earth, of earth we make loam, and of that whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel. Imperious Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. That is, it's chinking in a wall. Okay? Mortar in a wall. Oh, that that earth which kept the world in awe should patch a wall to expel the winter's flaw. What happens to everyone? You die and turn to dirt. That is the king that held the world in awe. Now, that second, you know, one, the word that kept the world in awe, that could be Caesar or that could be Alexander the Great, the two greatest emperors at the time, might be reduced to stop the wind. And then we see the king and queen come in and Laertes and other followers. Here comes the king, the queen. The queen. Who, who is this they follow? He sees the body borne in on a beer. He doesn't recognize the body. It's covered in a shroud. And with such maimed rites, why are the rites maimed, mutilated, incomplete? And he's implying something's happened with the funeral rites. Some, something's been shortened. Something's been cut. He doesn't understand why. This doth betoken the corpse they follow did with desperate hand fordo it own life. Fordo. It fordid itself. The maimed writes, Hamlet is saying, as he hears them, it's like certain prayers are omitted. And he realizes that means whoever that is killed him or herself. So he and Horatio hide. Ophelia's bodies take it to the grave. Laertes, what else? What what more ceremony? Come on, there's got to be more than this. Hamlet, that's her, that's Laertes. Priest, her obsequies have been as far enlarged as we have warranty. Warranty, allowance. We've done all that the church allows us to do. Her death was doubtful. Right? The gloss tells you, uh, actually doesn't say anything about doubtful, says about warranty, prescribed practice, religious order, etc. Her death was doubtful. He means by that, 
it was probably suicide. We're not 100% sure, but it, we're pretty close. And but that great command or sways the order, she should be in ground, unsanctified, been lodged till the last trumpet. What great command? Uh, the king. King said, she's going in hallowed ground. You don't have to do the full service, but you're doing enough of it. She goes in hallowed ground. Till the last trumpet, judgment day. For charitable prayers, shards, flints, and pebbles should be thrown on her. For char Instead of charitable prayers. Okay. Shards, flints, pebbles. 231. Broken bits of pottery. Why? Why would you throw? Assume for the moment that the priest means she's a suicide. Throw broken bits of pottery on her body. Because it's a, it, she's not in a casket. It's just the body wound up in a wagon sheet. Put it in the grave. Why throw broken bits of pottery? Where in the world does that come from? Well, you have in the Old Testament, at various points, you've got it in the Psalms, you've got it in the Book of Job, images of God as a potter. Right. So, assume that that's in the speaker's mind. What's he implying? The pot broke itself. This is like casting stones. She, she gets what she deserves. She denied God. That's what suicide ultimately is. It's denying God. My problems are so big, not even God can solve them. All right? Yet here she is allowed her virgin crants. That is, there her, are her people chanting and such. Her maiden strumments in the bringing home of bell and burial. Garlands betokening maidenhood. Strumments, flowers strewn on a coffin. Bringing burial, laying the body to rest to the sound of the bell. That is, when she is buried, all the church bells in Elsinore are tolling. Okay? English custom. When somebody dies, it's not done as much today. I'm, I'm, I'll bet it's still done in villages. When somebody died, the church bell was tolled. For a male, it was tolled nine times. For a woman, it was tolled eight times. So, somebody dies, you'd hear, and depending on how many times, the first time you hear that, that tells you whether a man or woman in the neighborhood died. So let's say it's eight times. And then there's a pause. So a woman has died. And then you hear 22. Bong, bong. That means a 22-year-old woman died. So you get eight or nine for man or woman. And then the number of years the person lived. So if the person was really old, you can have a bell ringing for 100 times. If the child was a year, one. So she's gotten that. That's part of the, in the English tradition, that's part of the Christian burial. Suicides didn't get that. They weren't acknowledged. Okay? Laertes, must there be no more done? Nope. No more. We should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem and such rest to her as to peace parted souls. Notice he's saying she did not die in peace. And because she did not die in peace, she will not One of the common beliefs is that suicides were those who wandered the world. They're ghosts. Lay her in the earth and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring. I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. When you lie, what's he mean howling? In hell. When you lie in hell, my sister will be a ministering angel. Hamlet, Ophelia? It just dawns on him. Ophelia? The queen, sweets to the sweet, 
I hoped thou shouldst have been my Hamlet's wife. Um, why? That is, Gertrude, I mean, Gertrude just told us. She really thought Hamlet was really married. What does that kind of um, put the lie to earlier in the play? What did Laertes tell Ophelia? That she was never be his lady anymore. What did Polonius tell Ophelia? Same thing. You weren't good enough for Hamlet. And here's Hamlet's mother saying, Shoot, I really thought you guys would hit it off. That obviously implies, good enough for me. If you're good enough for the queen, pretty much it's good enough. Notice what else that says. Hamlet hears that too. Okay. I thought thy bride bed to have decked sweet maid. I wanted to be one of those who would have prepared your bridal bower, which, you know, can be a little weird. Mother-in-law, I mean, son, just don't go there. Freud. And not to have strewed thy grave. Oh, trouble, woe, fault, and Tom's trouble on thy cursed head whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. What's Laertes mean? Hamlet, you're going to pay. It's Hamlet's wicked deed, right? Whose ingenious sense deprived Ophelia of her sense. Ophelia wouldn't have gone crazy if Hamlet hadn't killed her father. True? Or had she already started kind of going down the primrose path of craziness. What did she say after Hamlet's so-called soliloquy with her? Go back to Act 3, Scene 2, momentarily. <laughs> yep. Act 3, Scene... Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown, blah, 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 blah. Woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. What's, again, to see, to have seen what I have seen. Now, that's referring to both in the past and right here. To see what I see is right here. What's the to have seen what I have seen? To have seen Hamlet in his noble mind. To see Hamlet as the courtier, soldier, scholar's eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state. She saw Hamlet when Hamlet was perfect. What else did that mean to have seen? What was Hamlet to her when he was all of those things? Well, he was wooing her, right? He was sending her love tokens. He was writing to her. He was singing to her. He was coming to her room and talking with her. So to have seen what I've seen, that, and to see what I've seen, Hamlet, now, not any of that. To see, to now see, to perceive what I now understand, which is Hamlet is blankety blank crazy. Woe is me. I think at that point, she starts going. Her world has just turned upside down. Why? The man she loves, not yet had sex with, but the man she loves is no more. And you could even argue, possibly, where does that begin? Does it begin right here? I think it might begin with her father and brother saying, you got to break it off with him. There is nothing there. It will go nowhere. Imagine putting yourself, or imagine yourself in her shoes. You are wildly, deeply, madly in love. 
And your father and brother, whom you listen to, for whatever reasons, tell you, break it off. Well, what does that initially do, assuming you break it off? How many of you have been in love and it ends immediately? You walk around with a smiling, happy face and you're just feeling wonderful. No. Some people at that point consider suicide. After all, as several of you kind of wrote about, what's the importance of the play within the play in A Midsummer Night's Dream? Pyramus and Thisbe heart are who? Hermia and Lysander. What could the play, Midsummer Night's Dream, easily become? Well, if the Athenian law is fulfilled, you get Pyramus and Thisbe. What would they be willing to do? And we know this because they're willing to attempt to leave Athenian law. If I can't live without you, Lysander, I would rather die. Okay? And Lysander's the same. It's Romeo and Juliet taken to its logical conclusion. Okay? So, Laertes is saying, well, I find that son of a... He's dead. He leaps into the grave and embraces his dead sister. Now, kill us both. What's Laertes saying? I don't want to go on. My father's dead. My sister's dead. Implication is already their mother is dead. He has nobody to live for. Just come on, bring it on. Just bury us now. And Hamlet comes forward. Why? Because all this time, he's kind of been standing off behind a tree, but he's been listening. The, the audience can see him, but nobody else can. So if you're looking at the, you know, the stage perspective, column, column, they're all here. Hamlet's probably standing like here so that everybody, at least, you know, this part of the audience sees him. He's got like a trap door. Well, there, yeah, there, I mean, there's a trap door here in the stage that they could use to set her down into. Sometimes what's used for the grave is simply a coffin. So they put the coffin down in that, or the, the grave digger is standing in the coffin, kind of digging out. It's disguised to kind of look like her. Okay. So Hamlet comes forward. What is he? See, we probably will be close. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? That is, has so much power, so much potency, whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder wounded hearers. Who the hell do you think you are to be so struck by her death? This is I, Hamlet the Dane. And when he says Hamlet the Dane, what does the Dane really imply? Hamlet the Denmark. I, I, I'm the rightful king. We were told, you know, that he sent a letter via Horatio in Act 4. that said uh, page 1137 act 4 scene 7 lines 44 and following Hamlet sends a letter to the king high and mighty you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes when I shall for asking, asking your pardon there are to recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return now your gloss tells you for line 45 naked destitute, unarmed, without following. Yeah, that's all true. It also means what? It's kind of a mano a mano. It's just you and me now. Okay? It implies that. It doesn't directly state it. So, when Hamlet says, I'm back, this is I, Hamlet the Dane, he grapples with Laertes. Notice Laertes jumps him. Okay. The devil take thy soul. Well, well, that's not a very nice thing to say. Go to hell. Thou praised not well. And notice we get 
stage directions in Hamlet's speech. Thou praise not well, I pray thee take thy fingers from off my throat. <laughs> For though I am not splinative and rash, how do we know he's not splinative? Full of spleen, anger, and rash. We're almost at the end of Act 5, Seed 1, and he still hasn't? Kill Claudia. If he were rash when he saw Claudius praying, he'd have killed him then. And let God worry about where he goes. Yet have I in me something dangerous which let thy wisdom fear. In other words, don't push me. Don't push me. What did he tell his mother? His first opening speech? I have that within me which surpasseth show. Have you ever known somebody who's real, or maybe you've been this person many times. You've been so mad, so angry, and people knew it, but you know they're just not I had a long time ago, a lot, several years, over two decades ago, former department chair was trying to get rid of me. And so he was inviting graduate students into his office to ask questions about my teaching, about things I said about the department, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's all very, you know, spy-like. And a couple of students told me all this one day, and I went into class, and I was just livid. I mean, my hands were shaking. I was so mad. And they just kind of backed off. And they were all very wonderful that evening, right? Hamlet saying, be careful. King has them pulled aside. Why, I will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wag. What's the theme? Who loved Ophelia more? Well, it's kind of weird, because, you know, different kind of love, one hopes. Laertes didn't love Ophelia the way Hamlet did. Oh, my son, what theme? I loved Ophelia. Now, what could the king at that point say? No, you didn't. I heard you tell her. I loved thee not. Get thee to an enemy. But if he did that, what would he do? Whistleblower outing himself, you know. He'd be in announcing everything. How much? 40,000 brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. So... When Hamlet told Ophelia, I loved thee once, after his to be or not to be speech, and she said, I did believe it. And then he says, I love thee not, get thee to an utterly. Why does he tell her that? Because here he says, I love thee. I love thee more than 40,000 brothers. Love could ever count. So why does he tell her, get thee to an utterly? Because you, you can't read a speech in isolation. You can't watch a speech, a, a single speech of a play, in isolation. Yeah, it's got to be connected to the entire whole. Okay? So that what we get later in the play about Hamlet's character, that informs us about stuff earlier in the play. Now, Hamlet says earlier in the play, he's going to put on an antic disposition at times, right? Which means, I'm going to act crazy. Is this it? Or, to be or not to be, there is the... Is that part of acting crazy? Because we're told Ophelia's on the stage. So when he says, I loved thee once, yes, he meant it. So why does he say, I love thee not? What does Hamlet know is happening already at that point in the play? Ophelia alludes to it when he leaves and she gives her little speech. The observed of all observers. He, all, in fact, even before then, after his final speech with the with the ghost. Excuse me, not after the speech with the ghost. I think it's after the mousetrap scene. The play within the play. He says. No, it's not. It's when he says, you know, time is out of joint. Alas, that I was born to make it right. That 
little speech. Hamlet is suggesting, I've got to die. I've got to be the one that makes Denmark right. Why? Because something is earlier, even before that speech, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Something's got to cleanse Denmark. And he uses the language of being a scourge. Okay? In the Bible, predominantly the Old Testament, you don't have scourges mentioned in the New Testament other than the crucifixion. In the Bible, when you have scourges, the scourges are usually tools of God. But what happens to almost all of them? What happens to Pharaoh? Red Sea, boom. What happens to Nebuchadnezzar? He goes crazy, boom. They, they all ultimately die. Hamlet's kind of saying, it's got to happen to me too. King, oh, he's mad, Laertes. Queen, for love of God, forbear him. That is, don't kill him. To show forbearance means what? Patience. Endure, let, let him rant. Hamlet. His wounds, God's wounds. Show me what thou'lt do. You're going to weep? He's talking to Laertes. Not, he's for, forgetting. He's ignoring his mother. You're going to weep? You want to fight? You want to fast? You want to tear thyself? Come on. Let's, I'll outdo you in all of those. Drink up Isil, eat a crocodile, I'll do it. Just come here to wine, to outface me with leaping in her grave, be buried quick with her, and so will I. And if thou pray to mountains, let them throw millions of acres on us, till our ground, cinching his paint against the brain zone, make Isil like a wart. I'll rent as much as thou. Hamlet's simply saying, you guys didn't stop Laertes from ranting. Let me rant too. Why? What's the only way he has of expressing his emotions at this point? What do, what do each of us have to do sometimes? You gotta vent. You gotta blow off steam. Okay? So, the king tells Horatio, wait upon him, that is, take him out, get him some drinks, <laughs> calm him down, 5-2. Horatio asks, so, so, so what happened with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? And Hamlet explains, and he shows Horatio the commission. That is, he shows him the letter by the king to the king of England that says, kill Hamlet. And it's signed with the king's seal. Only Claudius could have done that. Right? He says, so what I did was, while they were asleep, I went down, I took their commission, this one, and I replaced it with one of my own. And being the son of the previous king, I had his signet, his ring, which has a stamp on it, which was used to seal hot wax. It's the seal of Denmark. It replaced Horatio. Line 42. Yeah, back up. So, Gildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. <laughs> that is, they're dead. They made love to this employment. They wanted this. They are not near my conscience. Their defeat does by their own insinuation grow. Tis dangerous when the baser nature comes between the past and fell insensate points of mighty opposites. Well, what does he mean? Baser nature. When common people get between two powerful people. What a king is this? Does it not think thee stand me now upon? He that hath killed my king and whored my mother popped in between the election and my hopes. It's not just that he's sleeping with my mother, but I should be king. Thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousin, is it not perfect conscience to quit him with? He's asking Horatio, am I not right? Should I not kill him with this arm? Don't I have the right to? Is it not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in? For Won't I be damned if I allow Claudius to go on? 
it must be shortly known to him from England what is the issue of the business there. He's going to find out soon what you did. It will be short. The interim is mine. The time between now and when he hears back from England, Hamlet says, it's mine. I'll take care of that. Okay? But then he goes on and he talks about Laertes. And he says, I wronged Laertes. I've, I've got to make things up. I've got to do right by Laertes. Okay? So Osric comes in, the courtier. For what purpose? Laertes wants to challenge you to a fencing match. King's going to get involved. King's going to bet on you. Hamlet's like, cool, I'll do it. Okay. Lord comes in, says, you ready? They're ready. They're in the hall. Okay. Hamlet's like, line 200, if his fitness speaks, mine's ready. That is, if Laertes is up for this, I'm ready. Now or whensoever. Okay. So the Lord leaves. And Horatio says, you're going to lose. Way to go, Horatio. Thanks for the confidence there. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I've been in continual practice. That is, I've been practicing my fencing. I shall win at the odds. But thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. What's he mean, all's ill here about my heart? Hamlet is telling us something's not right. Horatio, nay, good my lord, it's but foolery, that is, it's just butterflies. It is such a kind of gains giving, gain giving, as would perhaps trouble a woman. You know, women are kind of flighty, they have this, ooh, it's gonna happen. Well, in other plays, what women have we heard things from? Um, or heard about, at least. How about Caesar's wife, who said, don't go. And on the Ides of March, he goes out and, you know. If your mind dislike anything, obey it. What's he mean? Yeah. Well, actually, no, it's just the opposite. Because um, Hamlet is saying, his gut tells him. Horatio, if your mind tells you, if you feel ill, don't do it. I think it actually is the same. I will forestall the repair hither. I'll tell him you're not feeling well. Hamlet, no. We defy augury. What's augury? <coughs> Prophecy. Fortune telling. Okay. There is... Special providence in the fall of the sparrow. What? He goes from we defy augury to talking about Jesus. Because Jesus who is the one who said, God provides for sparrows. God loves you more than a sparrow. Okay? There is a special providence in the fall of the sparrow. That is, God watches over even the falling sparrows. If it be now, what's the it? So if he were writing this for me, if this were part of a paper, I'd circle that, put antecedent. What's the it refer to? The fall. Death. If death be now, tis, death is not to come. Right? Pretty, pretty good logic there. If I'm going to die today, then I'm not going to die tomorrow. Okay, cool. If it, death, be not to come, if death not going to come today, well, then it will be now. That is, if death is not going to come in the, sorry, misspoke. If death's not going to come in the future, it will be now. So what did he say first? If death comes now, it won't come in the future. If it won't come in the future, it's going to come now. Both times he's saying death's coming when? Clock's ticking. But if it be not now, if death will not come now, it will come. Why? Three skulls. Everybody dies. Alexander. Caesar. 
The readiness is all. And I don't know if I'm right about this or not, but the more I read this play, the more I think I am. I think that right there is the theme, the overarching theme of all of the play. And in one sense, maybe even of all of the tragedies. Readiness is all. Why did I put parentheses? What should go in here? The readiness for death. What's Hamlet saying? Was Polonius ready to die? Nope. Was Ophelia? Nope. Hamlet is saying, I'm ready. I'm prepared. Hamlet Sr.? was murdered while taking a nap. Definitely not ready. He is saying, if I'm to die now, then I should be ready. If I'm to die in the future, I better be ready then. If I'm not going to die in the future, I better be ready now. The readiness is all. We all have to be ready for death when? Momentarily. You walk out this room. God forbid something could happen. You get in your car, God forbid, something could happen. He's saying, you better be ready. The question is, is Laertes ready? Is the king ready? Is Gertrude ready? Why? Because they're all going to die. <laughs> Very soon. Since no, yeah. Is the fencing match at this time meant as like sport or is it for like, we're pissed off at each other? No, this is for sport. This is a, this is a simple... Hey, let's have some fun. Yeah, it's not it's not to the death. How do we know that? Because the, the foils are supposed to be tipped. They're supposed to be blunted. But Laertes takes his blunt off. And Hamlet doesn't notice. I don't know how he doesn't notice. He'd have to be pretty blind to not notice it. Because it's kind of like, it's, it's obviously it's not as big, but it's like the... The white rubber cap that you see on some canes, it's just smaller than that. Because a foil doesn't come to a point. It actually comes to a square. Because it's a long, thin cube, rod, but cubular in shape, um, of steel. Okay? So, the readiness is all. Since no man of aught he leaves knows, what is it to leave betimes? Let be. Since no man knows when his time is, what is it to leave the time? What does it matter when you leave? Let be. Let be. Let it flow. Or as Todd Beamer said on Flight 93, let's roll. Let's just let, let things happen as they're going to happen. Okay? So, we get the match. Hamlet goes in, and notice what he does. He doesn't go to his mother. He doesn't go to his stepfather. He goes to Laertes. Give me your pardon, sir. I have done you wrong. But pardon as you are a gentleman. That is, I expect you to pardon because you're a gentleman. This presence knows all these people here. And you must needs have heard, and I'm sure you've heard by now, how I am punished with a sore distraction. Everybody knows I'm acting a little crazy every now and then. What I have done that might your nature honor an exception roughly wake, I hear proclaimed was madness. He says, madness killed Polonius. Was it Hamlet wronged Laertes? Never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be taken away, and when he's not himself does wrong Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. It's the first instance of an insanity defense. Hamlet saying, if I wasn't me when I wronged you, then you can't say I wronged you. I deny it. Because the I that I'm now speaking is not the one who did it then. It's the other Hamlet, you know. That was the, the Mel Gibson crazy Hamlet. Who does it then is madness. You can't find me guilty. And we have the law today. You can't find someone guilty of manslaughter if they are found to be 
mentally incompetent. Whether it's madness or the low IQ. Someone who is a literal dictionary definition of the word idiot or moron cannot be accused of murder because they don't understand murder, period. It, it, it means nothing to that individual. So, if it be so, if I'm right here, Hamlet is of the faction that is wronged. I'm as wronged as you are, Laertes. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I've shot my arrow over the house and hurt my brother. He's saying, I consider you a brother. And what would have happened if what Hamlet wanted from the beginning of the play had transpired, if everything had gone according to what was apparently in Hamlet's mind. Laertes would be, his brother would be. You see, and Ophelia, as Gertrude suggested, would have married. So he says, forgive me. I am satisfied in nature, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge. Nature, by my birth, you killed my father prepared to die, you know, in Ego Montoya. So, Hamlet says, I'll be your foil, Laertes. In mine ignorance, your skill shall, like a star in the darkest night. He says, you mock me. Hamlet, no. Laertes isn't 30 years old and fat. Hamlet is supposed to be fat. His mother says, he's fat and winded. Because he's sweating. Okay? So, line 289. He's fat and scant of breath. She says, here, Hamlet, take my napkin, rub thy brows. The queen carouses, and she takes the goblet that Claudius set up, put the poison in, and she guzzles. And the king's like, oh, it's the poison goblet. Too late. <laughs> Laertes, and yet it is almost against my conscience. He's thinking, because Hamlet's now winning, right? He's gotten two strikes. All he needs is three. And they scuffle. Hamlet is stabbed. Hamlet gets Laertes' foil in the scuffle. He wounds Laertes. And Horatio says, they're both bleeding. Osric, how is it, Laertes? As a woodcock to mine own spring, Osric. The very same image that Polonius used to describe what he told Ophelia Hamlet's letters and such were designed to do. They were designed to deceive you, and he says, I am now deceived. In other words, what's the phrase Hamlet uses to describe what's going to happen to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Hoist with his own petard. He shot at Hamlet and hit himself. Hamlet is wounded. I am justly killed with mine own treachery. And the queen, oh, the drink, oh, and she dies. First death. Hamlet, villainy, treachery, seek it out. He calls for the doors to be locked. Laertes falls, and Laertes says, here's the treachery, here's the villainy. Thou art slain, no medicine in the world can do thee good, and thee there is not half an hour's life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poison too, she's dead. <laughs> I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. So notice what Laertes does almost with his dying breath. He outs the murderer. What did the ghost say? Murder will out. And Hamlet. Poison foil? King's to blame? Ugh. He stabs the king. And everybody, the presence, cries, treason, treason. Why? Because Hamlet killed the king. And then Hamlet goes and grabs the king, pulls his head back, forces his mouth open, and essentially waterboards him with the goblet. Makes him drink all that poison. Laertes, he is justly served. Justly served. That's judicial language. He got justice. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on mine. 
Why does Laertes do that? I've said before, this is probably the most Christian play of all of Shakespeare's plays. Yeah, and that comes right out of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And when Christ delivers that prayer, what does he say? Those who you forgive, they will be forgiven in heaven. Okay? He's saying, I do not hold it against you my father's death. I forgive you for that. Slate clean. Don't hold my death against me. Hamlet, heaven make thee free of it. Slate clean. And he also, he already essentially did that to Polonius. I took thee for thy better. I follow thee, I am dead, Horatio, wretched queen, and do you that look pale and tremble at this chance. Well, who are those? Those are the people on the stage. <laughs> They're all going, what the hell is going on here? But it's also, you audience, you readers. What? You are but mute your audience to this act. Oh, I could tell you. Could tell you what? Why this had to happen this way. Because what are those on the stage not aware of? That Claudius poured the poison in his brother's ear? That ever, the ghost? So Hamlet's saying, I'm going to die, and I'm not going to be able to tell you everything. I won't be able to tell you what you need to know to do what? To acquit me, <laughs> to think me innocent of all this. So he tells Horatio, report me, Horatio, and my cause are right to the unsatisfied. Well, who are the unsatisfied? Where's the rest of Denmark? Outside this room. Who would the unsatisfied be in our world? Say this happens in the White House, the West Wing. Everybody outside the White House. In other words, what's going to happen once the doors are open? You'll never believe what just happened. <sighs> Wildfire. Hamlet is saying, Horatio, you have to live for what purpose? You've got to tell the truth. Horatio, not me, man. I'm more an antique Roman than a Dane. I'm a good, stoic soldier. I'm going to die with my captain. Hamlet, nope, drinks the wine. Okay? He says, if you die, then what a wounded name, thing standing thus unknown, shall I leave behind me? What will people say about me? If you die and the truth isn't known, absent thee from felicity a while, what's the felicity he's going to absent himself from? Death. Death. What's another word for felicity? Happiness. Blessedness. Anybody know how Oedipus the King ends? It's almost literally the last lines. The chorus says, count no man blessed or happy, depending upon the translation, until he is dead. Why? Because life sucks. All right? Tell my story. I die, Hamlet. The rest is silence. Well, who comes in? Fortinbra of Norway. Why? Because that's why the ghost shows up the very first night. The ghost knows Fortinbra's coming. Well, Fortinbra comes, and we're told by Hamlet, because he says, Fortinbra has my election. He should be the next king. Okay? And what does Fortinbra do? He has Hamlet born out in honor. He died how? A good noble Dane. Fortinbra says, 397. Let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage. Like a soldier means full military honors. This is like when JFK died. The caisson down Pennsylvania Avenue, surrounded by the military, 21 gun salute, the whole nine yards. For he was likely had he been put on to approve most royal, and for his passage, the soldiers' music and the right of war speak loudly for him. 
take up the bodies. Well, the bodies, Laertes, Gertrude, and Claudius. Take those things away. Why? It's foul. It offends the eyes. Such a sight as this becomes the field. But here shows much amiss. So much went wrong. Why did it go wrong? Think of Polonius as it was. And what did they say? If everybody had acted on, had done the advice that Polonius gives his son, nothing in this play would have happened. Ophelia would still be alive. Polonius would be alive. Claudius Sr. would be alive. I mean, Hamlet Sr. would Everything, it, if it could go wrong, right, in this play, it does. Almost everything goes wrong. Okay, we'll stop there. Lear's going to be a little bit different. Hamlet ends, in one sense, on a note of hope, right? He forgives Laertes, Laertes forgives him. You know, Horatio will go off to his felicity in future. Lear... If you've never read Lear, if you've never seen Lear, get prepared for a very early 17th century kind of Jean-Paul Jean -Paul Sartre uh, existential life sucks and then you die, there is no meaning, period. Just bleakness and blackness. And if you need a good version, Amazon's BBC version with Hannibal Lecter, uh, Anthony Hopkins. As Lear, it's superb. It, I mean, it's like Hopkins was born to play this role. And in fact, there's an interview where Hopkins talks about this, where he played it once at 48, and he realized I can't do this. He says an 80 year old, only an 80 year old, can really do Lear, because Lear is supposed to be right around 80 years old. Okay. All right. If you have questions about your papers, um, give me an office hours. Email me.